Good evening once again. I'm Stephanie Rule. We begin this evening with the scope of the special counsel Jack Smith's investigation into Donald Trump and new signs that it is still growing. The latest revelation that investigators executed a search warrant of Donald Trump's Twitter account and the company had to be held in contempt by a federal judge before handing over the material. Here's one former prosecutor on the kind of evidence that they must have been looking for. The Twitter files that the Justice Department wants to retrieve clearly relate to that time period right around the election. All of those materials could be relevant. You know, it's fairly typical for uh, prosecutors to obtain social media uh, from uh, the platforms like Twitter, like Facebook and others. I think the only reason this is getting so much attention is that they resisted in this case and it had to go to the appeals court to get timely compliance. But clearly there is evidence here that is important to Jack Smith and the investigators. And so uh, I'm sure we'll see pieces of that during the trial. That's right. Twitter, Elon Musk resisted and the company was fined 350,000 bucks for delaying the execution of that search warrant. We're also still learning more on the previously secret memo laying out a plan and a roadmap for the fake elector scheme that was to overturn the 2020 election. There's a lot in this memo, and I think what the memo really does here is to contextualize all of the events that we've been getting, the trickle of events, first from the January 6th subcommittee, but then again from this indictment. And it makes clear that this was an effort, and an effort that they knew was false to basically defraud the American public as to how the election was conducted and ultimately to delay the counting of the votes, prompting this to go to the United States Supreme Court, thereby compromising any victory that Joe Biden might claim. Meanwhile, all eyes are on the court schedule in the classified documents case in Florida. Trump co-defendants Walt Nauda and Carlos de Oliveira are scheduled for arraignment tomorrow, despite the fact that de Oliveira has said he cannot find a defense attorney, a claim that a whole lot of Florida lawyers see as just another delay tactic. And while Trump is not scheduled to appear, his lawyers are still filing motions. Most recently, they asked that the government reestablish a sensitive compartmented information facility. You know what that is, a skiff. They want a skiff at Mar-a-Lago so Trump can view sensitive discovery materials in his home. So let me just make this clear for you. In a criminal case accusing the former president of illegally keeping classified documents at his Palm Beach club, he now wants special permission to view those classified documents at the alleged scene of the crime. And one more time, Trump and his allies keep arguing that there are two justice systems in this country. Well, by asking for this special treatment, he is asking for special treatment. And he is saying there are two systems and he wants to be part of the good one. Finally, as we expect to get a charging decision in Georgia next week, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution says indictments could focus on efforts to target some of the regular people that are at the heart of this case. We've seen people, including Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, also testified about um, exactly uh, as they did to January, the January 6th committee, about just the incredible effect, the incredibly damaging effect all of this had on them and their personal lives, their personal safety, receiving multiple death threats, and they were by, they were far from the only ones. Earlier today, the FBI shot and killed a Utah man while serving a warrant at his home. The Bureau says he allegedly made death threats against President Biden and other government officials. Agents were trying to arrest him just hours before President Biden arrived in the state. My colleague Peter Alexander has the details. The FBI says it happened at 6.15 this morning in nearby Provo, Utah, where they were serving an arrest warrant on suspect Craig Robertson, who they say was approximately 70 to 75 years old. There was a big boom, and then there was another one and another one. In court documents, the FBI says Robertson posted on social media, I hear Biden is coming to Utah, and that he was cleaning the dust off his sniper rifle. This Robertson Post, according to the FBI, shows a picture of his weapons, along with threats ahead of the 2024 election cycle. And the documents also say Robertson posted threats to kill Vice President Kamala Harris and the Democratic DA in Manhattan, Alvin Bragg, who's now prosecuting former President Trump. 
During surveillance in March, the FBI says it observed Robertson wearing a hat bearing the word Trump. And when agents attempted to speak with him, Robertson replied, I said it was a dream, adding, don't return without a warrant. For more, I want to bring in Clint Watts. He's a West Point graduate, Army veteran, former FBI special agent, and a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Clint, this is scary. People say offensive things about leaders every day. What do you think happened here that made the FBI feel like they had to move? Stephanie, I think it's probably because the threats uh, known as interstate threats in that charging document uh, very clearly were about the target. Uh, President Biden it also talked about Utah, and you could see that he was talking about even what weapon he was going to use, so he's very specific. At the same point, it, it is not unusual. I've done one of these before where somebody makes a threat on the Internet. You go out and you do basically a contact visit to try and gauge how serious it is. Sounds like the gentleman, when you read that uh, that uh, uh, document, uh, was not very friendly, uh, was not warm at all to the uh, uh, FBI agents that were there. And that really sets off some alarm bells, I think. Oftentimes when you go out, you talk to somebody, maybe in the heat of the moment, they said something uh, outlandish on social media. They walk it back. That was definitely not the case, it doesn't seem like. So all of, this, all of these items lined up, and it's at a time where we're seeing lots of threats being put towards the judicial system towards law enforcement officers and towards President Biden. So uh, I think they probably thought it was time they needed to do something, and it ended tragically today. He allegedly mentioned also wanting to kill Vice President Harris and Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg. What does that say to you about a possible motive? Stephanie, this is so uh, on track with what we talked about last week. You had asked about, you know, should we worry about mobilizations around court cases? And really, uh, the one to worry about is you know what the targets are going to be because they've been spoken about so aggressively in terms of social media and news conferences by the former president. You know what the targets are going to be. You just don't know who the assailants will be. And I think that's where social media gives you lots of clues and you have to follow up on it. And I have to say the FBI, remarkable work by them to even detect these sorts of things because there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of threats uh, all the time. It also seems like they may have gotten a tip from a social media company that really put them onto this in the beginning. So it's a really good demonstration of public-private partnerships that we didn't see, if you remember, 10 to 12 years ago in the ISIS era. I think the key point yeah. of this is every time leaders speak violent words, you're going to see more violence over time the more frequently people are targeted and demonized in their speech. Do we have to just get used to it? I mean, just even think in the last week, all the heated rhetoric only getting hotter directed towards official, officials at the special counsel's office. Yeah, I'm really worried, Stephanie, because uh, the other thing that we tend to see is uh, these comes in, in, in really a sense of contagion. You and I might be on here one night we talk about one threat. In this case, uh, the FBI uh, eliminated what seems to be a very you know, serious threat. But what's to say that doesn't inspire one or two other people at, at random around the country uh, to undertake arms or to undertake violence and try and target a public official, someone in, in the judicial branch or uh, somebody in the FBI, just based on this incident? So I think it's really important when we have elected leaders and, and, and institutional leaders that they speak. Uh, you know, in, in rational terms, they're not inciting violence, they're not picking targets, they're not encouraging people to mobilize. And so it, we'll really need to watch it in the coming weeks. I always get worried when we have one of these incidents that where we see one, uh, there's two, three, maybe four incidents similar uh, that could spring up uh, just based on the motivation from what they've seen in, in terms of the media cycle. Political violence at this point is nearing a 50-year high. Is it happening across the political spectrum? Yes, uh, Stephanie, and, you know, what's interesting tonight is uh, we, we maybe have disrupted one here in the United States in Ecuador. Uh, there was a targeted assassination uh, today as well. Um, we're just seeing a spike in this sort of intimidation uh, all the time. And I do think that uh, people worry about what they say in the online space. It, it will do them harm. If you remember in the beginning of the Internet and the dawn of social media, the whole idea was that people could go out, uh, speak their mind on social media, could feel free that they were not going to be uh, targeted or tarnished uh, in a way uh, through threats of violence. And I think we're going to see more of this over the next year. And I always like to note uh, to everybody when we talk about these threats of violence, uh, election years are when uh, the, the boil really hits in terms of the water. That's when everybody's, uh, the stakes get high, 
everybody gets really uh, excited about an election when they don't get the outcome they want. If you have uh, candidates or elected leaders talking about inflicting violence or that it, uh, violence should be there, that stochastic terrorism, that mediated terrorism where the target is known, well, you just have to keep looking for the assailants. And if, if the capacity is too much, think back to January 6th, uh, the FBI can do a lot, but it, it, if it mobilizes to that sort of a level, it's very difficult to contain or even disrupt. All while misinformation and disinformation is being shouted from rooftops and shot out of cannons. As CEO of General Motors, Disney board member, and chair of the Business Roundtable, Mary Barra is one of the most influential business leaders in America. Earlier today, we sat down to talk about the state of the economy, the future of electric vehicles, AI, and why cars, new and used, are still so damn expensive. Mary, I'm so honored to sit down because given your position as CEO of GM, you have insight into almost every element of our economy and you are based in the heart of our country. So I'd love to just start by getting your economic outlook. I mean, you've got employees and customers at sort of every income level. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. Uh, from an auto perspective, even when you see some of the economic reports, they're saying, you know, something is starting to, to lessen or soften the event, except autos. And, you know, we've really had pent-up demand, though, because if you think about it, we had COVID, where we were down for several weeks. Then we had the semiconductor shortage, where we couldn't make vehicles for a while. So we still have pent-up demand, and we're seeing very strong demand for our vehicles. And I, I do believe, you know, the this talk of, you know, it was a recession, then it wasn't going to be a mild recession. I think we're going to move through that. So, I mean, again, there's people who are far more expert than I am on that. But as we look today and we see what's happening, we're still seeing strong demand and we're seeing pricing hold uh, for the most part. You know, we're seeing a little bit of softening, but, uh, you know, well above where we were from a COVID perspective. Seeing that manufacturing has moved forward, why is there still such high demand for used cars? And those prices remain high. Well, I, I think it's like part of the whole ecosystem. So if there's still demand for for um, new vehicles and you can't get one, you go to the used car market. And we are starting to see those prices moderate a little bit more than the new vehicles. But I think it's part of the whole ecosystem. If you need a vehicle and you can't get a brand new one, you're going to go to the used car market. One of the big problems during COVID was the supply chain. Mm -hmm. The fact that we do not manufacture chips here really held things up for all sorts of industries, but especially yours. Since the CHIPS Act was enacted exactly one year ago, how has that changed your industry? Has it helped at all? Well, I think it's, it's too soon to see the, the results, but I think it's vitally important because one of the things we learned is we need more supply chain resiliency. And so the ability of the CHIPS Act to bring chips here, I think, is going to help in the latter part of the decade. I know we've changed our whole strategy on semiconductors to standardize on three families of semiconductors. And, and you know, we're working with many of the companies who will be recipients of the CHIPS Act to, uh, to, to get those chips built in this country. We were coming from a very dark economic place during those COVID times. Now there have been a lot of policy changes. Uh, the president calls it Bidenomics, things like the infrastructure law. How do you see that impacting your world? I mean, better, newer roads are, are certainly a good thing for all of us. Absolutely. But I think one of the most uh, important things, if you look at EV adoption in the uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, is the provision for charging. And if you look at, you know, I think uh, at least at General Motors, you know, we now have uh, new vehicles coming out almost every quarter that have the right range. Uh, but as people get over 300 miles of range and the vehicle meets their performance, it's the segment they want, they think the car is beautiful, they, they then, though, want to know that there's a robust charging infrastructure. And so as part of the uh, infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill, there's provisions to do charging. I think that's really going to help in some of the areas that the startups or new companies won't go into. A dense urban environment, you know, there's a lot of people looking at charging there because that's going to have a utilization that will allow payback. So I think that that's going to be very important for EV adoption as we move forward. When you think about AI, how is that going to impact? Because it's got to be big. Well, I think one of the most significant impacts of artificial intelligence is, is autonomous driving. And when you look at crews that uh, General Motors bought in 2016 when there was 40 people, we now have over 3,000 people there. A, a, a large majority of the people that are a part of crews are experts from an AI machine learning. And that technology is what is giving us autonomous driving, where they're literally the car is driving itself. When you think about electric vehicles, when we think about them, 
What do you see as the future? Well, you know, we clearly see uh, an all-electric future. And we are the only full, full line manufacturer to commit that our light duty vehicles in the United States will be all EV by 2035. And we're putting the technology plans in place. You know, we just revealed the, the new Cadillac Escalade IQ today. That's part of that journey that I'm really excited about. And for General Motors, we see that as a growth opportunity because as, and we're seeing it happen with orders, for instance, on the Cadillac Lyric, uh, almost 50% of the consumers who have a, a order for that vehicle are taking delivery are new to General Motors. So not only just new to Cadillac, they're new to General Motors. So we think with the right electric vehicles that we can grow, uh, grow share and you know, continue to uh, earn customers. Many people out there, when they think electric vehicles, they immediately think Tesla. How frustrating is that for you, given your commitment to the space? Well, I, I, you know, I think you have to respect the fact that Tesla really drove a, a much more awareness of, of EVs. We're very proud of the Chevrolet Bolt EV that, you know, frankly, is in more demand today than it was when we first launched it. But and and we're moving, you know, across all of the segments to move there. But uh, you know, I think you have to give credit where credit is due, and I think they raised a lot of awareness as as the importance of EVs. You're talking about pun intended, the nuts and bolts of running your business. Today, as a CEO, how hard is it to do that? You're also on the board of Disney. Disney has been embroiled in um, sort of an unplanned political, um, social, cultural battle. How, as a business leader, do you navigate all of that right now, given all the stakeholders? Well, I, I think, you know, you always, as you make business decisions, need to look at all your stakeholders. Uh, but also, we're at General Motors, and I think Disney as well, under Bob Iger's leadership, guided by the values of the company and doing, you know, doing what they believe is right. And I think as we move forward, if we can look and 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 you know say we're we're doing things because it's consistent with our values and it, it's it's in you know what's part of our business. Uh, I don't think uh, companies need to be talking about everything going on in the world, but when it impacts your business and you want to be doing the right thing, guided by your values. I will tell you over the last few years, when we communicate to our employees and we say this is the decision we've made and why, and we reinforce our values, you know we have strong support. If there was one policy, one change that uh, the president or the treasury secretary could implement that would help your company or your industry, what would it be? You know, I think, um, and there, we've come a long way with the different programs for, as it relates to climate change, but I think having a national energy policy. Uh, because if you, if you think about where we're moving and it's good for the, whatever your opinion is, it's going to be good for the company. If we have a national energy policy and we know where we're headed, that's just one. I'm sure there's, um, could ask questions and others would come up with better ideas. But off the top of my head, I think that that would be something that would move the country forward. One other place I do want to ask you about is China. Obviously, tensions are, are high between the U.S. and China. It's a huge uh, place of business for you. How do you see things going forward? Well, you know, we've said to both governments that we feel if, uh, the, two, if, uh, if the United States and China can, um, you know, find a way to uh, work together in the areas that are appropriate work to work together, it's going to strengthen both economies. And we, we firmly believe that. And so, you know, we advocate for uh, a level playing field in the, techno in the technologies or the industries that we're going to compete. And, and then I think it's the best company wins. Is it harder for you today, right? You're always dealing with governments to deal with our government. A few years ago, we had a Republican president. Now we have a Democratic president. Things change every four years. But now, is it harder than it had been in the past? You are well known in this country. You stood up um, to Donald Trump. You pulled out of Europe. You've had to make difficult decisions in dealing with governments. Yeah, I think, you know, in our business especially, because developing a new vehicle program, building a plant, setting a technology strategy where you're investing billions of dollars, what we need uh, is stability in policy. And so that's why when I think about, you know, uh, some of the, the different policies that really are going to guide multiple industries to make sure that we have a roadmap of where we're going that doesn't change every four years, I think is, is very important because I think that's better for the economy, it's better for job creation, uh, and it's going to be better for from a competitive perspective. Mary, thank you so much. I thank you. It. My thanks to Mary Barra, GM CEO, for joining us.